Good afternoon, brethren. Nothing quite like beautiful music sung to our to the praise and honor of our Creator. And um, that song we just sang, just a closer walk with Thee. Who with me my burden shares? None but Thee. And if I should falter, who cares? Who cares? Only Him. Of course, we have family. But when it comes to eternal life, forgiveness, He is the one that carries the whole nine yards. My talk today, brethren, is called Fear Not. And I'm going to start in Nehemiah. My wife and I were reading through this, and the uh, comparisons were were uh, quite few. I'm, I'm sorry, quite many, I should say. There are quite a few of them. And um, most of us have heard of the book of Nehemiah. Um, hopefully all of us, most of us have read it. Nehemiah uh, came later after Ezra, I believe. Nehemiah, I believe, was the king uh, Artaxerxes' cupbearer. And he came before Artaxerxes, and he had a long face, sad face. His countenance was not what he used to be. And Artaxerxes says, you're not sick. Something's not right. He was a very wise king. He knew uh, those who liked him. Artaxerxes liked these people. So Nehemiah went on to explain about Jerusalem. He says, the walls are broken down, the gates are burned. My people, Israelites, Jews, they, they were called Jews by then, but there were more than just the Jews there as far as the tribes of Israel. And uh, the king says, what would you have me do? And um, now the king's word was, that's what we would call today, gospel. That was the law. So um, the king, to make a long story short, the king gave him permission, gave him timbers to rebuild the wall he went back to Jerusalem. I, and for what I understand, it's just under a thousand miles away, if I understand that distance correctly. Now I'll stand corrected on that. But there were people already back there. They were trying to build this wall. They're trying to build the buildings, the temple. And there were those who did not like that. Anything sound familiar today? <laughs> Anything coming to life here? Now, there was a man named Sanballat and Tobiah, and there was an Arabian. Sanballat was the governor of, I believe, Samaria, which was a province under, by that time, under the rule of um, Artaxerxes. But Artaxerxes made Nehemiah the governor, just like the same title as what Sanballat had, but Nehemiah was the governor of Jerusalem. So, <clears throat> what happens is competition. And this jumped out at me because the adversary does the very same thing. We have a job to do, we're called to do a job, and there's one stumbling block after another. Now, we're three months away from the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, we got July, August, September, okay? By the time we hit early September, Hopefully we all have our reservations made. But by the time we get into late August, early September, wait and see what stumbling blocks lie in the way, what problems crop up. And the, the 40 years we've been doing this, I can't remember maybe three or four where everything went just perfectly smooth. Now that I'm a feast coordinator, every year has been a problem. There's been a problem. And you have choices. We all have choices. Excuse me. Either we face the problems and we deal with them, but we ask our Creator first for help and guidance. Or 
We turn around, throw our hands up. I can't do it. But that spirit he gives us, we have to make use of it. So Sam Ballot and Tobiah and the Arabian, I think it's, uh, uh, his, uh, I'll find his name in here, I'll tell you what it is. They were given Nehemiah a real hard time. And uh, I'd like to turn to Nehemiah. Let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. And I'm not going to read much in this. Chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. And uh, this is Nehemiah's prayer. The first thing the man does is he prays. Because who is... Who is the author of confusion? The adversary. If you're confused or if you're afraid, you're going to make the wrong choice. Fear is one of his best weapons. So Nehemiah, picking it up in verse 8, Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If we transgress or this one says, if ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. And that's already been done by the time Nehemiah, then this is written. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heavens, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Yah, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant. Why, how endearing is that? And the prayer of thy servant who desires to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. So here he is. He's beseeching our creator. Do we do that? Do we beseech him and ask him to lend his ear and hear our prayer? <clears throat> this is written for us, brethren. All this is recorded. And there's millions of copies of the Bible. I guess that's the most, uh, the most sold book or copies of the, the most popular book in the world. And looking around at our culture in this world, you would think there were none, almost none. Nehemiah chapter 4. All right, Nehemiah chapter 4, uh, verses 9. It would help if I was in chapter 4. Okay, I'm going to read a, a couple excerpts out of here, brethren, uh, chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 1, and I'm going to skip through. I want to make the point. I want to make a point here. But it came to pass that when Sanballat, now Sanballat was the guy that was envious um, he um, was hateful. He plotted. He, he paid an insider in, inside Jerusalem, paid him to try to get him into a, into a position where he could kill him, where Sanballat could kill him. But anyway, uh, Sanballat and his friend Tobiah are a type of the adversary as far as I can see here. And they're out there. And Nehemiah was hounded. Hounded. But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. So think about these words, how he's applying them 
and think about how they're applied in our lives and uh, do some comparison in your own mind and heart. And he spake before the brethren the army of the Sumerians and said, what do these feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end of the day and make an end in the day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps and of the rubbish which are burned? For Tobiah, the Amorite, was by him, and he said, Even that which they built, if a fox go up against it, they shall even break it down. It's discouragement 101. That's exactly what it is. You can't do that. You don't know what you're doing. Oh, that whole thing is a fairy tale. Verse 7. I'm skipping now to verse 7. But it came to pass that when Samballot and Tobiah and the Arabians uh, and the um, Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth. They were really upset and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer this is very, very important. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our Elohim and set a watch against them day and night because of them. Verse 16. Same chapter, verse chapter 4. And it came to pass from this, that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work and the other half of them held both the spear and the shields and the bows and the, I guess the um, harbor grinds, I'm not exactly sure what they are. Armor? Is that armor? Okay. And the rulers were behind them, but behind all the houses of Judah. They which build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that uh, labored or laden, every one with his hands wrought in the work, and the other hand held a weapon. So they're working in stone. These guys are masons. This is not made out of two by fours and two by sixes. These are made out of stone. And these guys are working. They got one hand in the work and the other hand on a weapon. What, what does that describe in your mind? These guys had a mind to do it. To do it. They put the effort forward. Our creator could have sat back and then probably Sandballot and the Sumerians could have taken them out. But that's not what happened. If they prayed to our Creator, He picked up the rest. For the builders, every one his sword girded by his side, and so built it, and he that sounded the trumpet was by me. And I said unto the nobles, and to the rulers, and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall, far from one another. This wall, from what I understand, was about 1,800 feet. So these guys are some distance apart. And there's not a lot of these workers. So they had to have the armament. And that place thereof, therefore, ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye hitherto unto us. Our Elohim shall fight for us. You hear the trumpet, help us. But our Creator is with us. He will help us. The point here, brethren, that I'm getting at is under duress, and duress is coming. Don't, don't think this is going to be a cakewalk. It's coming. Uh, the adversary and all of his minions and those who he has deceived are plenty, okay? And they will do everything they can to thwart our Creator. And since they can't, the adversary can't go against him, who does he go against? Us, those who, who love him, those who keep his commandments. Now here's, here's how far these guys go. And this is interesting. Uh, well, let, well, let's read this. We'll pick it up in verse 10, chapter 6, verse 10. Afterwards, I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehelbi, who was shut up 
And he said, Let us meet together in the house of Elohim within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come and slay thee. Yes, in the night will they come and slay thee. Here it is. There's boatloads of fear. Let's go into the temple, because we're going to come. Now, the doors aren't hung yet. The walls are up, but the doors aren't hung. Or I should say the gates. So, Sam, uh, so um, Nehemiah says, And I said, Should such a man as I flee? And who is there that being as I am will go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, I perceived that Elohim had not sent him. How was he able to perceive that? What is this day all about? The spirit of our creator is given. This man, and these people understood how that worked, and these people had the spirit of our creator. And lo, I perceived that Elohim had not sent him, but <clears throat> that he pronounced his, this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so and sin, and that they might have matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. My Elohim, thank thou, think thou upon Tobiah. Now this is what he's saying. My Elohim, think upon Tobiah and Sanballat according to their works, and on the prophecies of Noradiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. You're going to run into them. They're going to be there. It's written, brethren, for us. Now, chapter 5, here is another situation that cropped up with this man. To, uh, uh, with this man Nehemiah. Now, the people were there. They came. They were building, building the wall, rebuilding the temple, and building, rebuilding some of the uh, the structures there. And there were profiteers among them. And the uh, the people could not tend to their vineyards and to their homes and everything because they were helping to try to get this thing built. So what happened? is the king's tax or his uh, requirements of the land still had to be paid. So the profiteers lent them money with interest. And, and, and the law of Moses, that's absolutely forbidden. You do never, never apply interest to a brother or sister or to an Israelite. And these people were, they were being burdened. So they went to, to uh, Nehemiah and Nehemiah didn't know it. So he gathers the nobles together and says, what are you doing? They don't even have the walls. Though the walls are up. They don't have the temple, qu temple quite finished. They don't have the gates on. The place is still under construction. And they're going back to doing the same thing that got them taken away for 70 years. And if you read more, I'm not going to touch on it today, but if you read more in Nehemiah, the, uh, the vendors were coming in, okay, and buying and selling on the Sabbath. And uh, Nehemiah got upset with these nobles, and he said, what are you doing? We're going to end up back there all over again. This is the same thing that got us in trouble. So he ordered the gates closed. So the vendors are outside the gate. So... Uh, he says to the vendors, you know, you keep this up. I'm going to come down there, and I'm going to lay hands on you. Put it in a modern vernacular, I'm going to rough you up. I may even slap you around a little bit. Don't come around. From sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, I don't want to see your face. But Nehemiah, this is the point. These people came out of captivity. And they were scattered because of they, they had dishonored or ignored or rebelled against the commandments of our Creator. And this is the Sabbath Nehemiah was talking about. They should have known this. This should be inherent in them. Oh, well, I'll, I'll buy this, I'll buy that, with no regard to the Sabbath. 
So you can see why he got upset. I like to, um, uh, we already read chapter 6 through 10, 14. Uh, okay, I like to turn to the chapter 8. Chapter 7 has a lot of names in it. It has about 40 verses of names. So I'm not going to get into that. Some of them are, for me, are very hard to pronounce. But you can read that at your own leisure. Now, this is, uh, starting in verse 9 of chapter 8, uh, my Bible has it subtitled as Celebration Because of the Law. I'm going to pick it up in, in chapter 9, chapter, chapter 8, verse 9, I'm sorry. And Nehemiah, which is the Tishrite, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto the people, This day is holy unto Yah, your Elohim. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. The law was read, and what happened? You know, when, when we read the scriptures, what are, the, what are the one of the things that we do in our own minds? We start comparing ourselves. We start, like, oh, brother, I've been doing this all my life. I shouldn't be doing this. Well, that's what these people were doing. This day is holy unto Yah, your Elohim, more than not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto Yah. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of Yah is your strength. That's very interesting. And this, this brethren, I would consider to be forgiveness. And a commentary on this, this commentary is by Henry Morris. I just find it interesting. The reading of the law had caused weeping as the people realized their failures. Nevertheless, Elohim had preserved them as he had promised. And this new beginning was a time for thankful rejoicing. Paul talks about thankfulness and our Creator's blessings of peace. This particular phrase, joy of Yah, or joy of, uh, yeah, joy of the Lord, joy of Yah, occurs elsewhere only in Matthew 25, chapter 25, verses 21 through 23, where Yah rewards His faithful servants with the invitation to, anybody know what that is? Enter thou into thy joy, into the joy of the Master of the Lord. <clears throat> so these people heard the law. They were cut to the bone, to the marrow. Now, um, Another thing I want to broach here, brethren, there are, I, I got to cut some of these parts out. It's, it's interesting, but please feel re free to go through and read it. I'm bringing out some highlights here about comparisons, about evil, the adversary, what he will do, especially to those who are weak, to those who are weak, okay? He will pick on them. He is a coward. He is a coward, and he uses deception. But when it comes to facing our Redeemer or our Father in Heaven, he knows he, he can't do it. Who's he pick on? At any rate, uh, this is chapter, chapter 9, and it's called The Great Sins of Israel. And I want to read a portion of it. But they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hardened not, hearkened not unto thy commandments. He's talking about 
the forefathers. And he is confessing their sins and his own. And they refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art an Elohim ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, great kindness, and forsook and he and he forsook them not. Yea, when yes, when they had made them a molten calf and said, This is our Elohim that brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and had wrought these great provocations. You may understand what's being said here. Pharaoh's army had been wiped out. The, 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 the Red Sea had been parted. They'd been being fed all kinds of uh, wonderful food. In fact, they had more meat than they know what to do with. For 30 days, the meat, they were going to have enough because they complained about not having meat. So our creator sent the meat. It's coming out their nose. And um, he gave them everything. The cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And hear, hear what they say. And when they had made a molten calf and said, This is our Elohim that brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and had wrought these great provocations. It's incredible. But brethren, that's the way the human heart and mind works. They had a, a wonderful king in him. And, and back in Samuel, what did the whole nation of Israel? Every other nation has a king. We want a king. So what's our creator say to Samuel? They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. He knew what was going to happen. He told, look, you want a king, you'll get a king. But understand, they're going to conscript your men. They're going to run before the chariots. They're going to fall in the fields. They're going to tax your land. They're going to take your maidens. No, we want a king. We want a king. So, and these people said, it wasn't our creator. It wasn't Yah that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. It was just stupid molded, molten calf. And that's what they, that's what they wanted. And it's incredible. But it's there. It's there. At any rate, Yet thou in thy manifold mercies. Now, uh, th this prayer is, is making a comparison between their provoking our Creator and His mercies. And yet thou in thy mercies forsook them not in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud departed not from them by day and led them by the way, neither the pillar of fire by night, to show them light and the way where then they should go. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them, and withheld not the manna from their mouth, and gavest, um, and gavest them water for their thirst. Yes, forty years thou didst sustain in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing, and their clothes did not wear out, neither did their shoes, and their feet didn't swell. Moreover, thou gavest them kingdoms and nations, and didst divide unto them corners so they possessed the land of Shihon and the land of the king of Heshbron and the land of and the land of Oz or Bashan. So he put up with them. He put up with them and he forgave them. And forgave them. And this is leading up to today, brethren. To today. Today is a celebration that the Spirit of our Creator poured out His Spirit, not just unto the Jews, but to the Goyim, as the, the Jews would call us, the Goyim, the, uh, the of the nations. And He showed us and He gave us great mercies because before, before He did that, we were wallowing in a lot of slop. And he cleaned us up. If you ever get a chance to see Passion of the Christ, 
It is a brutal movie. Now, there's a lot of movies you can watch that are brutal. Explosions, uh, uh, people being decapitated and shot up, burned, and they are meaningless. There is no meaning, there's no usefulness in any of that. But this movie, Passion of the Christ, where you see how he is brutalized, brutalized. Okay? When you look at that, um, what was the name of the producer of that movie? Uh, Mel Gibson. Yes. He did a good job on that. And um, it, it visualizes what sin, what it takes to be forgiven. And I can just picture being there watching this taking place. I know when I was in the movie house watching it, uh, it brought tears to my eyes looking at what he went through. But that is what it takes. I had a, I had a person say to me, I won't watch it, it's too brutal. But it has meaning to it. Yes. If, if, it if it is in, in, um, emblazoned in your mind what it takes to be forgiven of the sin, it's worthwhile watching the movie. John chapter 16, verses 32. Um, Now, our Redeemer is uh, telling his apostles and his followers that there's a time coming, and now is the hour that ye will come, that will come, and ye will be scattered, every man to his own, and ye shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Now, I want to talk a little bit later on about this peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Um, do any of us here feel the, the ingress, if you will? That's a technical term used by uh, NEMA enclosure manufacturers, degree of ingress. But ingress means creeping in. Any of us feel that in our lives? That uh, tribulation is pushing in? Evil is pushing in? And he tells us here that I have spoken you unto you so you might understand and know this is going to happen. It's going to happen to us. In the world you will have tribulation. Be, be of good cheer I have overcome the world. Every man will go to his own place, but I am not alone. My Father is with me. He has overcome this world. Things we must remember. Acts chapter 2. Romans is another excellent book for encouragement, brethren. Acts chapter 2. I think most of us here know where I'm going with this one. Chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And they appeared unto them, and it appeared unto them as cloven or divided tongues, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We were talking about this yesterday in the Bible study. The, uh, the various talents or the various uh, capabilities that the Spirit of our Creator gives us. But you notice 
We don't see the Spirit. We don't see our Father in heaven. Or our Redeemer described the Spirit as the wind. It comes from one place and goes to the other. We don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. But for the sake of the apostles and those present, this Spirit, Holy Spirit, was visible in the form, in the form of a divided or bifurcated, if you will, fire. And it lighted on them. And then what happened? These guys started speaking in tongues. That's one of the first things that were said. Oh, you guys are drunk. These guys are, these guys have been hitting the bottle already. <laughs> and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these Galileans? And how we hear every one of them speaking in our tongue, Parthians, Medes, Edomites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, and the list of countries goes on, areas goes on, uh, and strangers of Rome, Jews, or pro and proselytes, Cretes, Arabians, um, and do we not speak in our own tongue the wonderful works of Elohim? And they were all amazed and were, and, and were in doubt, saying one to another, what, what's this mean? Others mocking said, these men are full of wine. Peter said, we're not full of wine. It's too early for that, fellas. And, um, but there again, there again, there's that doubt. Our Redeemer ran into it all the time. All the time. He raised Lazarus from the dead. The man was dead four days. He stank. Four days. Raised him from the dead. He goes and has a um, um, uh, thumbnail sketch now, brethren. He goes to Lazarus' house with his sisters. He's having a meal. People are, are crowding around to see Lazarus. They knew he was dead. This man's alive. What did the three Ecrats want to do? What did the politicians of the day want to do? Kill him. We got to kill this guy. This is evidence. <laughs> and our Redeemer said to the Theocrats before this took place, he says, look, if you don't believe me for my words, Believe me for my works. You see them. How can you not understand and believe? They understood. They knew. Their hearts were like hard rock and concrete. They were concerned about their position, their money, their income. We have it today. Those fellows back then are no different than the fellows we got today. I'm not picking on any particular group of people, brethren, but what I am saying here is we've got to be careful. We've got to be on guard. And the spirit of our Creator, if we pray and ask Him, He will show us. Philippians, that to me this is a very, very important one. Philippians chapter 4. Okay. Oh, there we are. Philippians chapter four. Now, Nehemiah was a man who loved our Creator, and our Creator loved him. It may not say that directly in there, but if you look, if you look at Nehemiah's works and what he did and how he handled things, our Creator was with him, and he loved him. All right, and now... Um, 
Nehemiah understood these principles here in Philippians that Rome, uh, Paul was talking to the Philippians about. Let's pick it up, uh, chapter 4. Uh, let's pick it up in verse 4. Um, it's a subtitle, Peace with the Eternal, or Yah. Rejoice in Yah, with the Lord, always. And again, I say rejoice. It's repeated twice. It's important. Fear not, our Redeemer says. I have overcome this world. Do not be afraid. Don't be anxious. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Yah is at hand. Let your moderation, how you live, how you conduct yourself, how you talk, be careful for nothing or be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto Elohim. And the peace of Elohim. Now, we were talking about this in our Bible study last time. And the peace of Elohim, which surpasses or transcends. Some, some, some translations have transcend. Some say have passes, surpasses. But it transcends all understanding. And it shall, this peace of Elohim shall keep your hearts and minds through Messiah Yahshua. What does that mean? How does that affect us? What does that do for us? We read the words, does anything jump off this page? To me, brethren, it does. And that's why the Messiah, I believe, went to the stake and had no fear. He had no fear. The peace of our Father in heaven, which transcends all understanding, it is disarming to the enemy. Paul went to his death a happy man. It didn't bother him. And if, if you're trying to punish someone or hurt someone, like the adversary tries to do us, and it's, it's ineffectual. All of his, all of the enemies, or your enemies, physical, um, ammunition does not work. His offenses are gone. And they are, his, their offenses are gone. The adversary's offenses are gone. In other words, they're on the offense because our defense is far greater than theirs. They can't understand what is the matter with these people. And uh, when our Redeemer was hanging on the stake, what did the, what did the theocrats do? I'm talking about the scribes, Pharisees, and the priests. They walked by. They were making fun of him. Well, he saved this. He did that. He's going to tear the temple down and rebuild it. They had no idea. They had no idea who they were talking to. But our Redeemer said to his father, what? Forgive them. That's what peace does. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. And brethren, there may come a time when we will need that peace in abundance and great measure. Because I'll tell you right now, from my, my standpoint of view, I, if it wasn't for our Creator, granting me mercies, forgiveness, and his peace, I could be a very nasty individual, to be honest with you. But there is a time when this uh, peace we may have to put into, into use. In fact, we should be doing it every day. It's better to be what? What does scripture say? It's better to be wrong. Okay. Better to be wrong. Take it on the chin. Why? Because this is something honorable and respectful, and our Creator notices it. And it transcends all understanding. Now, we all know about the Apostle Paul. Uh, I, like, I like Paul's writings. Uh, some, I remember some folks saying that Paul was a chauvinist. Paul's not a chauvinist, but they use that.
Now, um, I was looking for Anyway, I'll, I'll give you a thumbnail sketch. Um, we've all read in Paul, I believe it's in chapter 8. We've all read in Paul that we have, we are, we have been foreknown. Remember that part? Predestined. Been foreknown and predestined. What did he tell Elijah, Elijah at the, at, when he went back to that to, uh, was it, uh, Mount Horeb or Sinai? He said, what, what are you doing here? He said, I'm the only one left. I'm not, no, you're not. No, you're not. I got 7,000 that haven't kissed the lips of Baal. We don't know that. We don't know how many he has. But at any rate, more than likely, brethren, I think he foreknew them, and he said, I have reserved them for myself. So he picked this group of people out. He reserved them for himself, and they never did bow the knee or kiss the lips of Baal. This is a very similar principle. We have been foreknown, we have been predestined to be made into the image of our Redeemer so that he, our Redeemer, is the first among many. And therefore, we have been justified. My wife looked up the word, not guilty. Much like we saw in Nehemiah. They read the law and these guys were just shamed to the core. And the priest said, don't be sad about it. He's forgiven us. This is a time to rejoice. We've been justified. We've been glorified. We've been made whole and right. And I think verse 18 continues probably for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which we shall be received revealed in us for the earnest expectations of the creature waiteth for or creation should be waiteth for the manifestations of sons of men Paul goes on to say what can separate us and this is where this is where the peace of our creator and that comes through his Holy Spirit that we celebrate today. That's, that peace gives us the ability to, um, to understand, number one, but it gives us the ability to take on a chin and to take the future, whatever it might be, and not flinch. Just like our Redeemer, just like Paul and the Apostles. And brethren, that gift of the Holy Spirit that was shed and poured out, should I say, was poured out on this day thousands of years ago is, um, is for us. The, uh, I, I used to say in other talks, ending other talks, I say, brethren, this is who we are. But then my wife said to me, she says, well, what does that mean? How does that tie in? Well, brethren, we are modern-day saints to be of what they were like in the Old Testament, like uh, Nehemiah, because, because the apostles, through our Redeemer, His Spirit, He gave them, He taught them and showed them. They also taught us, and we learned through their writings. And we are, we are part of that same spirit, that same calling, the same group of people, okay? We must realize that. We must realize that. Because the adversary knows exactly who we are. And if he has his way, and we open that door to him, he will surely step in. He will, he will make a mess of us. But in all things, in all things, brethren, like Paul says in Ephesians, you give thanks to our Creator for all things. 
This is in Yahshua's name. This is pleasing to him, our Father. It's pleasing to him. And in, in his pleasure, he gives us peace. That no matter what happens, regardless of what's coming down, makes no difference to us. Because this is all passing away anyway. Anyway, brethren, this is who we are. Yes. 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 Yes.